Welcome to the Physique Development Podcast. Today, we are joined by my friend, Chad Morgan. Chad is the owner of Beyond Built Training, an established one-on-one coaching service. He is also a men's physique competitor, a great one at that. Today, we have a conversation on reverse dieting. We define it for you as well as give you all the tips and tricks on how we approach reverse dieting with our clients. It's a gem of an episode. Let's hop on in. Chad, it is so good to see you, my friend. For the listeners, this is our first time actually meeting face-to-face virtually, I suppose. We've had a lot of conversations on on social. I've been a big fan of, of Chad's work as a whole from a, a media perspective as well as his results with clients. Chad, welcome to the show. I'm like super happy to be here. Super grateful for the opportunity and uh, um, for what we're speaking about today. Um, I'm sure it's going to be awesome. So excited to play some pitch and catch, go back and forth and have a damn good time. Absolutely. So with those results, you, you've had great results with your clients. And I think that a topic that you and I have had conversation on via social and DMs is, is reverse dieting. And I think that people have a lot of questions pertaining to reverse dieting and, and the approach to it. And I thought it would be a fantastic idea for us to dig in and give people some of the insight within our experience, as well as our knowledge on the topic as a whole. Yeah, no, would absolutely love that. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and and give people a definitive definition. So we have a a good starting point for us. How would you define reverse dieting? Reverse dieting is, I believe, first, not something we should almost time constrict or put in a specific window. Like we can have an idea of how long it could last. Yet, you know, sometimes what I see with reverse dieting is, as we progressively, and this is kind of the definition, um, as we progressively add in calories over the course of every week or so, or every couple weeks, as we can support them, um, the results can be phenomenal in terms of improved energy, in terms of just less stress, in terms of better performance, which I think is the big one. Even just the physique improves, especially coming out of a diet, um, when you start filling back out and you start seeing that it's like almost like through the reverse diet, you look better than you did at the end of the diet, at the end of the diet, which is awesome. So I think to define it as a whole, it's a, um, a time and a period where you're slowly adding back in food from either the end of a diet or before you even start one. If somebody has been, you know, eating a low amount of calories for such a long time. Um, and we want to bring them up to a higher maintenance level to just feel more energized, to just feel better overall, to recover better, to sleep better, to have less stress. Um, it's just a period of time to help somebody get back to maintenance calories or even more um, to begin performing their absolute best in all aspects of life, mentally, emotionally, physically. The the point that you bring up with starting with a reverse diet is a very special one, because I think that this happens much more frequently than individuals realize, because in my experience, and I don't want to hear about yours as well, I would say that more often than not, this is kind of the first stage for us to dig into. It's it's not a matter of the person wants to come and, and lose body fat. And the reality is, is that they've been consuming far too little of calories to even lose body fat at this, at that point. So what has been kind of your experience on that side of things, or what have you seen be more common for clients who are coming to you in that position? Oh, it's so common. Um, like, and I think it's also a little bit of like a letting go of control thing that almost is the biggest breakthrough for clients immediately starting out. Um, when we kind of have an idea of how many calories they've been consuming, let's say that we start them just having them track what they're eating on a daily basis. And we get to see that, okay, hey, like you're 140 so pounds and, um, you're eating around like 1400 calories on average, but you're going to the gym five times a week. Um, ideally we'd like to see that maybe closer to, 1700 seven like 1700 1800 as far as like where your maintenance could be and they're like wow that sounds terrifying (laughs) um and so just like meeting somebody where they're at first i think is a huge key and then all right let's let's start here but like let's slowly walk you up as with what you're comfortable with and as a result of doing that they're like oh my gosh like i'm getting hunger cues again like wow, like I'm sleeping better. Like my gym performance is going up. I'm like, yes, this feels awesome. Right. 
yeah, I want more. And like when you get them to say, I want more, boom, like the whole, the whole world opens up for them. But I think what the coolest thing is, is like, let's say that this is the first one to three months with somebody and they come in and they're like, I want to lose fat. And then they have to learn the lesson that they're not totally prepared to do it. Right. By getting them excited about adding in more calories to then prepare for the fat loss diet. What happens with that first three months, what I typically see is that we see body recomposition take place. We see because their performance is improving so much, they're now in a place to recover better from training, which as a whole, like can start getting them to build some tissue. Um, and when they're just less stressed, they're like dropping a little bit more water and they're seeing the, their physique kind of come to life. And sometimes what happens is, I mean, someone could reverse five, 600 calories and their body weight could stay the same. I see that happen a lot. Um, some people could start reversing and see their body weight go down those first couple of weeks, right? And so this whole first one to three months, for lack of a better term, is a complete mindfuck <laughs> for, for people. Um, and it ultimately just opens the door to see how food and using that as fuel to their performance is what will create the physique that they want to. And when they start thinking about it that way, we now get to the point where the end of the reverse, but now we can make a decision. Hey, like with where we're at and where our physique is, is it best for us to start focusing on gaining more tissue or losing fat now? Right. And so I found that in most cases with individuals, like that's where their journey really begins. Um, and it's a huge shock to them because when they think about starting a journey with a coach, they're like, I'm going to lose fat right away. Right. And I think, kind of challenging that belief um, really helps them see the longer game of the whole process. And it's such a, it's, it's a very much a healing journey for them in that sense. to so look at fitness in a much less restrictive manner and a much more long lasting manner. Um, so I, I think there's so many benefits to reversing, but um, I think that's one of the biggest things that I've seen. Absolutely. There's so many benefits and we can kind of dig into those in, in terms of we've, briefly touched on each of them as we've gone back and forth here. But if we wanted to kind of highlight the the benefits that we want to see from a reverse diet, what would be, just to kind of bullet point them, what would be the benefits that we're trying to see? Well, <clears throat> we could see metabolic upregulation. Um, you know, typically the, they'll get to a point to where because <clears throat> they have more energy and they're recovering better from training and now they have more fuel and for lack of a better term, more material to now repair, rebuild, grow, keep going. Um, because of that, you know, the metabolism can start getting faster, um, which will get them to a point to where the act of fat loss is much easier than it was before. Because if we're starting at like that, if we use that same example of that 1400 calorie point and you're like, let's lose weight, let's lose fat. Well, now we got to go down to like, 1200, 1100. And, you know, that's not going to last very long. And that's going to put us in a state by the end of the diet um, that is not hard to recover from, but just not a fun time to recover from. And there's just really just no point in getting to that state um, at all, um, especially for somebody that's lifestyle. So, you know, we can see metabolic upregulation. I think um, the body itself, um, the body itself does a really good job of communicating its needs to us. And so, like, what I like to tell people is that, like, when we start adding in that food, our body is like, hey, like, I've been wanting this for so long. And because you're giving me a little bit more, I'm going to signal and I'm going to tell you that I want more of this, which in turn, someone's appetite comes back. And they get to a point where it's like, I used to have no appetite at all. Like, I'm eating such little calories. Like, I can't eat more food. I can't eat more food. But anytime I do, I gain so much weight. It's like now the body's communicating you its needs. And it's like, I wanted this for such a long time. Like, go use it. Like, I'm going to give you more energy so you can use it now. Like, go in the gym, go crush it. And then you're like getting better pumps. And like your body's just giving you the feedback that all of this is such a plus, such a positive. And it'll also respond visually. Appearance-wise, um, just the process and the act of seeing your muscle bellies kind of fill out more. Um, like what you see from a body recomposition 
standpoint take place is awesome. So I think metabolic upregulation, I think physique improves, energy improves, performance improves. You're going to sleep better, likely. Um, you'll see stress go down. So I think those are the big heavy hitters in terms of um, what the the benefits um, from a physical perspective can be. Absolutely. And I would add as well, from a, a female perspective, improving hormonal function, if that was potentially yeah. lost in the dieting oh, yeah. phase, I would say for a majority of lifestyle dieting uh, experiences that they're not going to lose their menstrual cycle. At least they probably shouldn't, you know, nine times out of 10, there may be some greater stress cases that that may be the case, but for most, that's not going to be a situation, but you would see that in a, a reverse diet more often than not, if that was lost. Oh, hundred percent. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. So if, if we want to set the stage for a, a reverse diet, I think that giving context here is going to be very important when we're looking at how the dieting phase went and because the reverse diet is going to differ from person to person depending on how how things went as a whole so if we look at it from a lifestyle perspective i want to dig into lifestyle first and then we're going to also look at contest prep because reverse dieting in those two settings are not one in the same they have some similarities but definitely not the same approach in both of those so from a lifestyle perspective we will have a client a who is who was 140 pounds she dieted for 12 weeks she lost 14 pounds and i'm going to test my uh math from the top of my head here uh once now she's 126 pounds <laughs> there we go sweet uh so she lost the 14 pounds in 12 weeks pretty successful dieting phase we are at a calorie allotment of let's say 1400 calories at the end of the dieting phase her cardio is let's say uh five sessions a week at 45 minutes a piece that's pr that's pretty solid output here so that is our end point and now we're going to take this client to a place of, of reverse dieting and getting her to a, a maintenance what are some of the key points that you're focusing on to set the stage properly to get into this reverse diet and have a very successful reverse diet so earlier i said that i don't necessarily like putting time constraints on anybody but i like the idea of a window um to keep in mind i i you know i don't not like and i don't go into this like it's an end all be all of like oh it needs to be this amount of time like because again like if somebody's responding from it so well if it ain't broke don't fix it kind of thing is my approach with especially reversing um <laughs> heck like we've seen clients at that almost exact body weight female like work their calories up like three to 400 over what they were pre diet. And they're like 133 pounds now instead of 140. And they're just absolute tanks and they look so much better at 133 than they 126. So it's like, and <clears throat> like, why not? <laughs> like, you know? Exactly. Um, and so sometimes it can also be a game of let's, so let's see how many calories we can reverse ourselves up to. Sometimes it's that game. Um, but I think a general outlook on it is if you died at the 12 weeks, um, let's spend at least half to the full amount of time we spent dieting and getting back up to the maintenance. Um, and so immediately out the gate, if we're at five days of like 45 minutes of cardio, maybe we bring that down to three to four and maybe we bring that down maybe around like 25 minutes. And I think that as we progressively add up the calories, we could just taper off the cardio a little bit, but I'm a fan of doing a pretty big taper, especially if it's lifestyle and it's 14 pounds and it's not contest prep. They're not extremely lean. Um, I'm a fan of a bigger taper kind of up front. And let's say that they had a step goal there too. Well, let's keep the step goal consistent. Um, immediately after that, let's look to add based off that exact body weight. How like we can add 150 to 200 calories right away. Okay. Um, and then monitor from here. And I think based off the decisions, like once we make that first decision of the calorie increase, let's take a look at their biofeedback and let's say, has hunger increased or decreased in adding back the food? Um, I think that's a big thing. You know, I think that's like one of the, one of the big markers I look at, but also how's like digestion, like, is it improved? Is it worsened by adding in? 
foods again. Um, in terms of food choice and quality, <clears throat> I'm looking at, all right, well, if you ended the diet eating these foods, let's just add in a higher quantity of the foods you've already been eating. It's not, oh, 200 more calories, let's go get French fries. Like, if you're adding in back foods that are not higher in satiety, then likely your hunger will increase. Um, if we add in foods that we were already using in the diet, we can li likely get satiety back to a more manageable state, just in, in consideration to where it was at the end of the diet. So if somebody is like more hungry after that first week and I'm looking at the data and, you know, maybe they've even went down in scale number after adding more food because maybe they were just a little bit more physiologically stressed or even systemically stressed and adding in food that first week brought that down and their body weight went down half a pound or a pound. That's awesome. Like I would even add in more food that next week. If they rode that 200 calories out and uh, they got more full, performance was better. Um, body weight kind of maintained or even went up one to 3% even, cool, let's just keep riding this. And I would tell them, hey, if your body weight's up, it's just water, it's just glycogen, you need it, you need it, go use it, go get awesome pumps. Um, and so in terms of <clears throat> how I would look at it, I'm just going to focus on that first couple of weeks and just take a look at their biofeedback, communicate with them, and just make adjustments accordingly off of that. Now, by week two or four, if their body weight actually goes down, let's add back in food. If hunger goes up again, okay, let's, let's add back in food. Um, I think what's normal is expecting two to three percent of somebody's body weight being gained over that first couple of weeks. Like that's completely normal. And that's kind of the expectation I would give them. I'm like, if your goal weight was 126, expect that five percent more weight is going to be your best look. So I think mentally the approach is not seeing somebody, having somebody feel like the peak physique was the end of the diet, but it's actually five pounds increase from that. That's where you're going to look and feel your best. That's the accomplishment. And that even gets them a little bit more mentally excited for the reverse act itself. Um, so that's where I would begin. And then everything else is, you know, context based from that point forward. But does that kind of answer the question a little bit? Yeah, I think that something that we could even further expand on is assessing where mentality and emotion are at prior to getting into the reverse. I think that this is a powerful conversation for us to have because oftentimes individuals are, are going to end a dieting phase in an emotional place that could be really positive. It could have gone very smoothly. It could have been uh, semi-linear in, in nature of that fat loss and, and how we just described it. In 12 weeks, having lost 14 pounds, I would say that is pretty linear throughout that whole process. So that person was probably pretty chipper at the end of that dieting phase. But there are times where individuals have to push a little bit harder than maybe they thought. And so they come out of that dieting phase a little bit more emotionally charged or or beat down. And so that's going to be something that we have to factor in to our approach to that reverse diet as a whole. So let's say that uh, the individual was in more of a challenged position of following very emotionally charged, maybe, um, how would you address that situation? Well, number one, um, I would have a conversation about the emotional charge and like, what are the feelings? Right. And, um, I mean, I, I love that we're going here. I, I love this conversation. Um, <clears throat> I would just ask, okay, what, what feelings are coming up? Is it fear? Is it, uh, is it, you know, massive accomplishment? Like if it's massive accomplishment, let's freaking celebrate. Let like let's celebrate. Like let's do that. Um, if it's fear of regain, okay. What are we telling ourselves right now in this moment that is producing the feeling of fear? Well, I'm telling myself that the last time I ended up losing 14 pounds, I ended up gaining 14 pounds back in six weeks. I'm like, okay. And so this is a conversation about understanding that your history is not, not your destiny. That's a given. It's easier said than done. Um, and it's a conversation about how can we shift the meaning and shift the story. And typically, the individual just needs the facts and saying, all right, what did you do previously that caused that 14-pound regain in six weeks? Well, I kind of just like gave myself like two cheat meals a week right away. Um, to celebrate because I deserved it. And I'm like, that's awesome. 
And do you feel like that's something that you would want now? And he's like, well, maybe, yeah, but not if I'm going to gain 14 pounds. And so I'm like, okay, how about we create a way for you to actually celebrate and have a great meal? So why don't you just go out and have the meal right now? Because I feel like if you fear that, let's go conquer it. Let's have the meal. And I want you to sit down and I want you to be super present. And I want you to be super mindful. Take a few deep breaths, like even narrate it out loud. What does it taste like? What does it feel like? Is your heart racing fast? Is your mouth salivating? Like what are the feelings? And then you ultimately from that practice in its own realize that it wasn't all that. It wasn't all that. Like two, you're satisfied. And three, you're most likely excited to get back on track with what you were previously eating. So how can we see what the feeling is, understand the story that we're telling ourselves that's creating that feeling? How can we actively create a practice to eliminate that fear? And also, how can we get you to understand fully what is to come? Um, So that way you're fully on board with it and you're not going into it with a bunch of question marks. Because if we go into this with a bunch of question marks, with a lot of doubt, like with a lot, a lot of understanding, what happened in the past is totally fair to happen, right? Totally fair. It could happen again, right? But how about we approach this a little bit differently than how you did in the past? And here's the difference with how, how we're going to approach it now versus how you did. Do you feel comfortable with that? Awesome. Right? So I feel like that's the active and ongoing conversation um, with females specifically, like the dysmorphia that comes up and you know, seeing them go in the opposite direction. I mean, male included too. Um, Seeing them go in the opposite direction and feeling like they're kind of losing the work. Like that's another conversation. Um, And I had this occur with actually a male athlete who went from 250 down to 180 over the course of the year. Um, Lots of diet wrecks (laughs) during that. (laughs) Yeah, I imagine. (laughs) Because that's big weight loss, right? So, um. And he's still, you know, working his calories up from where it was ended on October to now. And he's now like 24 pounds up. And he's like, yeah, I'm still struggling with eating more and, you know, seeing the scale, the scale go up because, you know, I work so hard. And I, I can't imagine like, you know, seeing yourself in the 200s again because you find you were you spent so much time getting out of that. And I was like, look at your back to backs. And he was like, oh, right. And I'm like, I don't think you realize how much credit you should give yourself. So there's just so many ways to like work with that feeling and emotional charge, but it's just really being able to get in tune with the athlete and just have conversations and, you know, share that space, um, you know, share our side of the story too, with what we struggled with and just focus on the connection piece. I think that is the, the huge link in, in somebody's success. I agree. I think the, the communication and the ability to reframe the thought process or, or how things are being viewed is so, so important because it may be the first time that the individual has had a successful dieting phase. And it's like, I don't want to lose this. I, I feel that I'm in power and, and, and I don't want to lose the uh, feeling that I have right now. And I think that being able to provide the facts and give them an understanding of, hey, you're not actually losing anything. You're gaining from here, not in a, not only are you gaining weight physically, but you're gaining strength and you're gaining better sleep and hormonal function. And all these things that are a benefit to you are going to be in your life because you do a great job through this dieting phase or through this reverse diet as a whole. And so I think that that's a, a powerful way to go about things and maintaining that communication. Because when we look at getting into a reverse diet or a dieting phase or any situation, it's very important to have that open and honest conversation with your coach to allow for us to understand where your mind is at. It's not a matter of being able to mind read and and those different factors, because I can assure you that all of the studying and and, um, work that we have done, cases that we've had, none of it has included any mind reading ability. That would be pretty cool. I would love to be taught how to do that. Maybe, (laughs) honestly, maybe something that I would hate to have the power of. It may (laughs) drive me insane if I was able to just look around and be like, I can read that person's mind. I can read that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> right. Um, okay. Back to, back to reverse dieting, uh, as a, as a whole. So we've, we've kind of dug into the, the lifestyle component of things. When we look at training for that lifestyle client, is there anything that you are changing or adapting to in that period of time as you get into the reverse diet, uh, from a training perspective? Yes and no. Okay. Um, 
because I think it differs between, we're, we're actually, let me just keep the focus on lifestyle because sure. that's what you asked. Um, so still yes and no. <laughs> um, so it, it, I think it depends on their progressions and like, I am of belief in a lifestyle diet that training and progressions can be sound throughout the entire thing, especially with starting 12 weeks. Like, I don't think there's any sense in saying that somebody's going to expect digressions. Um, we could most definitely, let's say if somebody had programmed five by five barbell back squat in for the first six week training block of that, of that diet. Well, sure, he could probably by week five of that um, feel pretty weak, worn down, fatigued, um, achy, and uh, that can be alleviated just with training structure in general going into the diet. Um, but I think uh, coming out of it, it depends on how somebody is really performing. If they are still maintaining great progressions through the exercises and they're still getting great stimulus in terms of like, I feel it, my mind muscle connection is great. Like I'm getting great pumps. Um, still like, I'm still like kind of even holding the pumps a little bit to an extent. Um, and we're still adding reps. We're still adding load. Then like, cool. Like we can keep these in and like, we can milk the progressions out. Um, now because we're adding in more food, I also feel like this is a very advantageous position for somebody to add tissue relatively quickly coming out of it. And so in this case, um, if they ended at a certain amount of volume, um, that was like not necessarily pushing them to a point to where it's like, this is going to be the maximum that you can recover from or barely recover from, which I don't think we should really take somebody all the way there in terms of volume, especially at the end of a diet. Like how about we create the first six week um, training block out of this to get you to that point to where it is like a amount of volume that is maybe by that last week, a little bit difficult to recover from to where you're obviously going to need that deload afterwards while you have that extra food. Like let's, let's put it to some use. Um, so in terms of like exercise selection, even rep range selection, if things are progressing and looking really, really good, awesome. Um, if not, let's say that the individual is not really progressing well towards the end of that. And we take a look at it and we're like, well, this movement isn't really getting me much of pump anymore. This movement isn't really, but the movement itself was like, let's say they had barbell bench still in, right? I was like, yeah, my progressions are kind of stale here. Um, like my joints are kind of achy and the rep range was seven to 12. Let's do dumbbell flat bench and let's get you in maybe the 10 to 15 range with that movement or even seven to 12. Um, and we could maybe argue that that exercise would have more of a return in terms of like how it feels, your stimulus, and now we can create more progression with that. Um, those are little things that we can do. So I think it all depends on where that last training block is in the last of their, tra of, of their diet. And let's, let's look at the data. Um, let's make decisions based off of that. But I think that the total amount of volume that we can work somebody towards in that first training cycle out of the cut can probably be a little bit higher than where we had it end at the end of the diet. And I think that's maybe the only approach that I would take in that first training cycle out of the reverse. I can agree with that. I think that there is is value in the time frame where we're already bringing up food and probably having better training performance and having better energy and better sleep. It's probably a great time to try and, and maximize the quality of training performance and those different factors. And so by being able to, and, and, and this is a situation where the individual is not dealing with any injuries or they're not dealing with any just nagging soreness and things of that nature at the conclusion of the dieting phase, uh, which for a lifestyle client, I do not think is going to be the case. Oftentimes my brain automatically just kind of clusters them all together. And then I have to have a second thought of, okay, this is actually, this is different from this. And then we have different sections for these things. And so when we look at, uh, now that we've talked about the setting the stage for the reverse diet, we talked about the training when we look at the progressions from a nutritional perspective, 
do you have kind of a, I know you said not a set timeline, but do you have a, a rhythm to how frequently you may be changing the nutrition? Because I know that for myself, something that I want to prioritize is being in the reverse diet for as short of a period as I can be so that we can just get back to maintenance and move along with our approach as a, as a whole. So I would love to hear your thoughts on how you approach kind of the timetable of things and the progressions that may be there. Very much athlete dependent. Um, like I said, like a little bit earlier, I'll use this client for an example who, um, man, she's a pleasure to work with. She's so much fun to work with. But the reason is, is cause like, you know, it's never a question in terms of like how well she will adhere, um, and the responsibility that she takes everything towards. Um, and <clears throat> in that sense, like we decide like in, in that, in that situation in that case we played the game of like let's see how high we can actually like bring our calories towards mm -hmm. and in that situation it was like one to 200 calorie jumps like basically every week um and that was the game we played in in that course of time like again we brought our calories like way over to where she started at and that was that case that we took it's just different person to person. Um, you know, if I'm going to, like you said, kind of mesh it all together and look at like, what is the typical average approach that I take? I'm like every two weeks that in like 200 calories. Um, like you said, I love that you made this point. Let's get somebody back to maintenance or above it kind of as quickly as possible. Let's get them like recovered. Um, it also depends on the quote unquote severity of the diet, right? I think it depends on Okay, how, what percent of your body weight did you lose? How are you feeling? Um, where are you hormonally? Where are these things? And based off of that, let's, and we're not going into my contents prep, but like, let's say that somebody had to lose a big amount of weight and their energy is low and they're not sleeping well and their training performance has suffered. Um, you and I wouldn't like to get somebody to that to that state for no reason anyways, but let's say that's the case. Like, let's not look at just a 200 calorie jump. I mean, let's, let's consider going almost as close to maintenance as possible right away. Um, and so I wish I could put it into like a standard, but I would say that like immediately out, you know, depending on the size of the individual, a two to 400 calorie jump is probably appropriate. And then going off of that feedback and maybe looking to add in that same amount of calories every two to three weeks from that point, I would say if I were to collect everything and like put an average out, that would be the approach. But it, it, it really and, and likely depends, but the whole goal would be to get somebody to maintenance kind of as quickly as possible, or at least within the same window that they spent in the diet. Yeah. And I think that the, the pace, uh, body image is going to play a massive role in the pace that we're setting where the individual is at and working through some of those things. It's not a matter of if someone's having poor body image that it's like, all right, we're actually going to elongate the, the dieting phase and just call this a reverse diet, but we're really just going to continue to, to perpetuate the dieting phase. That's not what I'm saying. It, it's more of being able to make the approach and understand where the client is at and where they're at mentally. That's going to be of, of significant benefit for us. And for the listeners, uh, the 100 to 200 calories uh, marker here. I, I would say that uh, from a percentage perspective, because that may be more of a, a valid or a, a valuable tool for, for the listeners, maybe five to 15% increases every um, two weeks or so. That may be a good place for you guys to kind of look at and, and uh, utilize those tools. So I, I agree, trying to make it as, as short as possible, I suppose, but also paying attention to biofeedback markers and where scale weight is at and those different factors is going to be the, the large tools. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you.
you. So let's look at, let's kind of backtrack and, and look at a contest prep. Because I, as I said, this is going to look differently than our lifestyle approach as a, as a whole. So now we've had an individual in a contest prep. Do you have a, an average duration of contest prep that you would throw out? 16, 20 weeks. Okay. We'll say, we'll say the individual was, we'll say 20 weeks. So a, a long one lost considerable, considerable amount of body fat, obviously had incredible uh, stage presence, looked great and is coming off winning their overall. How are we setting things up from a reverse perspective? Changing the language. Yeah, this is where, this is where I, uh, I take, you know, I kind of look at, I kind of define them by three different phases, depending on the athlete, depending on the context of the diet and depending on the ending point, I go from reverse to post diet maintenance to recovery. Um, and a lot of, and this is the conversation I have with, you know, a contest prep athlete coming out. It's like, we're not going to reverse. We're going to recover. And they're like, what do you mean? Like here, here's what, May like let me ask you first like what is what do you like I asked the athlete let me ask you like what are you expecting to happen on the show what have you heard and typically what you'll see is they'll say well I'm expecting myself to like slowly add in food and like you know try to you know maintain the lines that I've that I've had and um and and kind of get back to a point to where I was eating more than I was when I started the diet but like really lean. And that's kind of what they think is the approach out of the diet. Um, and then enter recovery period chat. And it's like the number one goal we should be focusing on is how you feel and how you perform coming out of this. We could sit, we could sit here and if I asked you a question, like, how are you feeling like you are performing right now in the gym? They could say, good, but like, do you feel super strong? Do you feel like you're, you feel like, how you're training right now feels like how you were in the peak of your off season. They're like, no. Okay. Uh, if it's female, like we could talk like hormonal down regulation and we could have a conversation about that. Um, we could speak to, you know, all kinds of feelings. And I'm like, these feelings are the things that we want to change because these feelings are not sustainable. And if we slowly just add in a little bit of food and play a careful game the approach coming out because you've been, for lack of a better term, so dialed, so restrictive for an amount of time, like you're going to want to approach this reverse in a perfect manner because you've approached the contest prep pretty close to a perfect manner, if not a perfect manner, right? And now you have – the one thing that you have now coming out of the contest prep that you didn't have before is more freedom, right? If, if your partner said, let's go get – a burger, you can say yes. <laughs> and so that's something that you have to understand because on a human level, burgers turn us on for a reason. Like we are human. And at some point saying no, saying no, saying no all the time and staying restrictive can no longer be tolerable, especially if we do not have a high level responsibility to a end outcome of a goal of winning the show. Right. And so the approach is that conversation, number one, and understanding you are in a position that where you are so advantageous to how much growth you can see if we play this smart. And so immediately after, um, I like to kind of look at where was the average amount of food intake at over like maybe the last couple of days of loading and like start there. Okay. Um, and like start there. And I think it's, again, it's different person to person. Um, but Typically starting there or, you know, jumping close back up to where we estimate their maintenance to be. Plus, this is something that like I've now experienced that has completely changed the game for myself and our athletes. It's like the training structure being really intelligent coming out and we get them excited for that, right? We get them excited to train again because... <laughs> We could argue that the training isn't that exciting towards the end of the prep. And like, yeah. you want to feel like a beast, right? Yes. But it doesn't mean five by five squats anymore. Like we had to, we had to play a little bit of a smarter game, but it's like, Hey, let's give you the freedom. Go eat after the show. Go get the things that you want. Like, um, 
Caroline, like my girlfriend, was such a help with me personally coming out of my um, last prep. Because she's like, Chad, you said you wanted fried chicken like four days in a row now. Like, go get it. And I'm like, yes, you're right. And so by getting the fried chicken, I, I realized like, cool, I satisfied what I thought was a need. And then like, yeah, it wasn't all that. But I got it. And I'm like, good now, right? And so if you want to go get something, get it. Like, don't like – don't feel this urge or this need to continue telling yourself no. Like be able to heal that relationship that you have with the way you look at food um, and conquer those fears and have a badass training structure put in place to where you know that food is being put to damn good use. And getting them to really understand that and accept that and be invested into that um, and to be invested in the fact that like, I want to recover because I want to feel good and I want to pack on muscle tissue because I'm in a place to do it really fast. And when you can get them to say that, that really like that, that encapsulates what encapsulates what post-show recovery really means on a mental, emotional level, at a physical level, um, at every level. Um, so that's kind of the approach that, you know, I would take with somebody coming out of the show. Excellent. I, I think that the one thing to add would be with the approach of going to get the food that you've been craving. I, I think that there's, there's power in understanding that it's not a bad thing. Cause I think that oftentimes when individuals are going to overconsume or just sit there and, and kind of be guilty as they consume this food is because they haven't had the conversation with their coach of, is this part of the game plan? Can we create a environment to where this is, is fair game? And you've done that with your athletes. Thus, that is why you, you see more success with your athletes coming out of shows and, and having a good reverse diet or having a good recovery diet as a, as a whole. So that's a, a powerful component. Now, with the greater increase to calories following the competition that you talked about, how is there greater difficulty for the athlete to experience? Do they have, have you seen more adversity? Have you seen less adversity for them within their, whether that be their relationship with food of maybe over consuming or, or, um, having re reservations and wanting to actually have less calories in place? What has been your experience with athletes, um, in doing that? Yes. Um, in terms of, in terms of adversities, um, it's very fear-based. Um, it's very like <clears throat> unexpected, but I will say that this conversation happens about six weeks prior to the show. Today, okay. Um, for me and I can speak from prior experiences more so, um, that that's been a little bit more of a challenge. Um, I think the adversities that I feel that I feel occur still now is just a little bit of a lack of just pure motivation for it all coming out. And post show blues is a normal thing. Like it's a typical thing. I feel like what happens is individuals as they diet down to an extreme level, they're just peeling back the layers of themselves. And, um, for a lot of individuals, contest prep becomes such a tunnel vision to the point that any feelings, thoughts, things that are maybe perturbing them, they kind of like psh, brush it away, brush it away, gotta stay focused. And they use this prep as a crutch to their life. And I'm not going to be the coach to be like, what's going on? Like, let me like, let me like, you know, kind of unravel. It's, it's like, no, like we're going to focus on the, on the mission. Like we have this at hand. You are just going to learn the, the lessons that you need to learn. And so like, I don't want to step over and, and control the outcome of what happens after the show. Like I'm going to have co active conversations, even like I said, six weeks prior to it and be like, Hey, this is what's going to happen. This is what we're going to work on. How do you feel about it? Cool. Um, and I'm also sometimes aware that I've had people go into periods where, you know, I can see who's, I can literally use an overall winning athlete that we have, like say, I don't want to build anymore. I want to feel athletic and healthy. And I'm like, let's do it. Let's go after it. Like, let's, let's create this. Like, let's do it. Let's, let's go. Um, and then like four months later, I want to bodybuild again. I'm like, not surprised, but like we did it. Right. And, and so it's also like being able to honor their needs in the moment and, you know, not overstep. Some people may really just need some space away. 
afterwards. And, um, you know, that's totally okay. And I think that's some of the adversity um, that they face is kind of just the lack of purpose or the lack of motivation. And like I said earlier, as they peel back the layers, all those things that they were kind of brushing away to stay focused in the prep, those things come immediately to the surface afterwards. Because where were we brushing those away? We weren't brushing them away. They weren't going anywhere, but down deeper here. And so when the contest prep is over and the goal is accomplished, all of that comes back up. And now we're faced without that huge goal in front of our face to, to almost blunt our attention to everything that's happening around us. And we're faced to work on these things. And I think it's beautiful. Like, I think it's dope because I think that prep itself can be such a gateway for people to work on their development as a whole, um, like such a gateway for it. And to this day, that's really a, a big reason why I enjoy it for myself. Yet it's also a conversation of like, hey, do you need to do the contest prep to develop yourself as a person? Or is there also other active ways that you can do that? Right. So I think the biggest adversity is when those things come back to the surface afterwards. Um, in terms of food and a relationship with food, it's just fear about the food. It's just really guilt and shame around it. And, you know, those practices that we look to implement is like, hey, rather than, you know, say no, understand that in this moment saying yes might be progress. And when you go do it, like, really hone in on the experience. I think where people can maybe go wrong is I'm going to order the takeout and turn on the Netflix and mindlessly mindlessly go. I'm like, how about you turn this into an event and an experience in, in a way that's, some, that's special for you? Share it with somebody. Um, go celebrate because you've earned this rather than do it from a place of comfort, which is if you want to do it from comfort, Dude, like how fucking awesome is it sometimes to just turn on Netflix and just eat Doritos? Like I've done that and it's freaking dope, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. And coming out of the show, like having them focus a little bit on the experience piece of it, um, I think can help them <clears throat> kind of through that adversity. So I think there's a bunch of things, but that's kind of what I see typically come up. I agree with you. I think that there's such value in shifting the thought process because if you look at maybe a, a competitor who has worked with other coaches in the past and, and these cheap meals being these extravagant things that are all centered around the food and it being something that is like this escape from what the norm is and being able to pivot their mindset into a place that is more of, no, no, no these experiences are about the people that you're with. The food is, is a beautiful piece of the time that you're getting to spend with people that you love, but it's just a component. It's not a, a portion of us just to let, let go and, and just go hog wild type situation. And I love being able to see clients make that transformation because it's, it's just a light bulb going off in their head of like, I've, I've been speaking this over myself from the get go. I, I've been telling myself these things. And it was just a matter of changing that perspective to really allow for me to have such a more just I'm mean, freedom around food as a whole. So that's amazing. I love that we're on the same page there. Within the training, you had talked about uh, a really cool structure that you had for for post show for athletes. Do you have or yeah, post show for athletes? Do you have a kind of a framework that you would want to share with the listeners uh, pertaining to that training? Yeah. So I would look to first focus on like the first the first training block, and I'll get into like what the second would consist of, but. Um, I've found that a lot of that low motivation coming out of the show, um, can not necessarily all the be, be, way be alleviated, but massively helped with a freaking fun training structure coming out of it. And, uh, I'm talking use of supersets, you know, like you don't even need to touch a barbell, just go use machines and dumbbells and cables and like train like a bro for lack of a better term for, you know, for that time frame, um, especially kind of that first week. But, you know, in, in terms of structure, like we're using kind of like fun intensity techniques, um, like things like giant sets and, you know, things like rest pause sets, like stuff like that, um, that gets them the feeling of like a large amount of training density without necessarily doing a ton of work and accumulation um, 
that results in like too much fatigue coming out of it. But because you have all that extra food, like you're going to get such awesome pumps that like, let's focus on using rep ranges of like 10 to 20 um, that get you those awesome pumps with not a lot of taxation to the joints. Because a lot of that joint stuff really accumulates over the course of the prep that kind of presents itself afterwards. Um, and so like, let's not add in like barbells and like sets of five to 10 to get our strength back. Like, let's not do that right away. Um, let's focus on exercises that you feel are fun, exercises that you feel like will give you great pumps still. Um, and ride that out for, you know, four, six weeks from that, um, structure in a, a deload and a back off. And at this point you can do one of two things, um, go into like holding with training. <clears throat> so like kind of reduce their volume just to like what would maintain their amount of muscle and kind of like train at maintenance, which in a lot of ways maybe looks like four, five tops exercises per session and like two sets of everything for like four straight weeks. And it's like super boring. But you can also add in barbells again and kind of get the feeling of that in your hands, get your your joints to kind of feel that again. And like that's kind of the first baby step and, you know, starting to get to feel that that strength come back now that your body weight's kind of back, come back up. Um, you've accumulated like body fat to um, support that kind of training again. Um, so going into like a maintenance phase of like four weeks um, introducing some of those more stimulative, um, exercises that also might have a little bit higher fatigue cost, but because you're at maintenance, you can handle that fatigue. And so it gets you that feeling of that again. Um, and also like active recovery. Hell, like if you just want to take one to two weeks off and like maybe go on a trip or something or like, that's what I did. Um, <laughs> or, or like just hang out and, you know, stay active, go on walks, maybe go on hikes, like, Go If you want to go in the gym and you want to get an awesome arm workout in with your friend, do it. If you want to go in the gym and you want to do like, I don't know, like whatever kind of training, do it. Like, but you don't feel like you need to go in six days a week. Like if you want to go in and do cardio, do it. But um, I think psychologically that can really help because someone's been so rigid for such a long amount of time. Um, so those would be like the two approaches that I would take after, you know, kind of riding that high of all this extra food and energy, put it to use. And then that can't last forever because hell, you've been dieting 20 weeks. You've been putting your body through the ringer a little bit. Take some time off, um, depending on what they need, if it's actual time off or if it's maintenance. Um, and by that point, their calories should be at maintenance or above um, for sure. For sure, for sure. And uh, now we can talk about like the off season. Right. And I, I love that you brought up the active recovery component of things because I've, I've used this uh, in a, a number of different cases, depending on the duration of the prep and all those different factors to focus on hikes and yoga and, and just getting away for a little bit. And so those are very valuable tools. And I think that the, the main point that I really wanted to drive home with our conversation today was showcasing that there's so many different ways to go about this. And it really is framing it in a way that is successful for the person and it not being a one track mind of this is how I do it as a coach. And every single one of my athletes does it this way, because any coach that says that probably has a lot of failure cases in a reverse diet setting, because it's just does not work that way because each individual needs to have that care and understanding of where they're at mentally to really have the success throughout this period of, of a diet as a whole. Mm -hmm. Um, you get to the point where almost every answer to every question about reverse diet is, well, it depends, <laughs> um, you know, and, uh, that's, I mean, that's lesson number one, everything's in context. So, exactly. um, yeah, that's the beautiful part is being able to, um, you know, get really in tune with your needs on like every level. Um, and whether it's a coach that you're working with or you have a friend that really supports you, um, man, this comes back to what do I think is the overarching theme of the most important thing of all of this is a great support system. Holy crap. Living with Caroline throughout that prep and especially like post show, like being able to 
have her um like encourage me to go get the food you know when it was on top of mind and also be willing to go out with me and enjoy it with me and share the experience with me and also like having her in front of me like she she like her and I have both you know had you know certain experiences with overeating periods in in our life um and so we both kind of have that same wavelength to we know like when a good point to stop is and we're also not afraid to call each other out if we feel like we're going a little bit on the deeper end and so having a support system man like (laughs) above all else is like the thing for this yes because on the flip side you have someone who does not support you and you are living with a significant other that um is like just chomping at the bit for you to be done with prep and thinks that the life is going to go right back to where it was potentially before you were dieting or in that contest prep, that's a very challenging place to be. I've had athletes in that situation and I do not envy that uh, conversation that kind of constantly has to be had. But I would also argue that that individual may not be a good person to have in your life if that is your scenario. Because if this is something that means a whole lot to you and then you have someone who is a significant other, someone who should be your companion and partner that does does not support a big part of your life, there probably needs to be some evaluation that needs to happen. And so um, that's also, that's a whole other topic, but it's a really important piece to bring up when we look at, at the reverse diet. Um, I told you I'd keep you for an hour. We're, we're running up on that time and it great conversation. I'm so excited for people to dig into this one. If you can let everyone know where they can find you from a social perspective, I would be immensely appreciative. Yeah. Um, well, I appreciate you. Um, number one, um, number two, they can find me at like, at like, kidding me, Chad Morgan <laughs> on all platforms like Instagram, like gosh, man, Chad Morgan, Instagram, YouTube, Beyond Built on Instagram, YouTube. That's where you can find me and us. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you guys for listening today and we'll catch you in the next episode.